Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Colin Levy and uh, Kim Strassel. And uh, let's turn to Florida. The Florida legislature is going to pass a bill, a so-called heartbeat bill, that would essentially ban most abortions, not all, most abortions after six weeks. The governor has said he will sign it. Current Florida law is 15 weeks. The six weeks is comparable to a law that uh, was passed last year by Georgia. And Ron DeSantis has said he will sign this. He didn't have to do that. He could have said, he opposed it and tried to lobby privately for the legislature to keep it at 15 weeks, Colin. Why do you think he is uh, going along with this? Well, I think he likes playing to the Republican base, quite frankly, not uh, just in Florida, but outside of Florida. I think in Florida itself, it's a much more dicey proposition what he's doing, frankly. After Roe v. Wade was overturned, a majority of Floridians objected to that decision, and 44 percent of them said they strongly disapproved of it. And you had only about 10 percent that wanted to see abortion outlawed completely. So those voters generally have in mind something more like the 15-week law that Florida currently has. I think that's been a pretty good compromise, Paul. The six-week effective ban that he's proposing signing is something that's very, very restrictive for most women. You have to remember that at six weeks, you're only just getting a heartbeat. Gestational age is typically more around three to four weeks at that point, so it's very early in the pregnancy. It effectively means that a lot of women won't have access to the procedure. So that's very popular with the Republican base, which is happy to look at that and say, okay, well, that's going to prevent, A, a lot of abortions because people won't be able to have them because they didn't even realize they were pregnant by the time they needed to have the the termination procedure. And also just among the pro-life voters who know that this is a much, much tighter restriction than a 15-week law. Kim, I think you've looked at the Florida statute, and it does have significant exceptions. I mean, this has exceptions for rape and incest and life of the mother, but are there any others in including how a doctor might assess the status of the unborn child or fetus, depending on your point of view? This is one way in which it's actually very different than the current 15-week law. The 15-week law does not have any exceptions. So this six-week law now, as you say, rape, uh, incest, and pregnancies that come about as a result of human trafficking. Doctors are usually given sort of wide latitude in making some of these decisions. But it is notable that if you are claiming one of these circumstances, you will also be required to come with documentation of a police report, for instance, something to actually verify it, which is notable given that a lot of people who are in these scenarios don't always report their situations. So that's a new thing. One other thing I would note about this too, and it kind of goes along with Colin's point of how restrictive this is, under current Florida law, if you want an abortion, it requires two in-person doctor visits with a 24 waiting period in between. And that's a little less of a hurdle than it might sound in that the first appointment is usually about doing all the testing, hearing about your options, etc. The second one is where the procedure or the medication is dispensed. But if you're talking about six weeks, suddenly you might just find out days before and then you're looking at the situation where you have to try to get a doctor, make sure you can get them again 24 hours later. It really does raise hurdles. By the way, this is why the pro-life community likes it. Their complaint about 15 weeks was that it was essentially no bar in that almost all abortions take place before 15 weeks. So their view was that it really wasn't a restriction. I think what Florida is doing here now, though, is pushing the pendulum very much in the other direction into something that's a lot closer to an effective ban. And how that plays is going to be really interesting. The Florida Senate voted on it last week. You did have a couple of Republican defections. The House is voting on it today, and there's likely to be a couple more now. That won't matter. The GOP has a supermajority, but notably, all of those who are voting against it represent Democratic-leaning districts in areas like around Miami and Delray Beach. Mm, that is interesting. And the, the politics of this is going to be absolutely fascinating and also contentious, as we know. The dilemma, I think, for the Republicans, and let's give them credit, the people who are voting for a six-week ban and 
Governor DeSantis. I have no reason at all to question their sincerity. They believe that abortion is a moral wrong, and they want to uh, do what they can to minimize the number of abortions that people have. Now, the issue is when you have a view of a policy belief that something is morally right but may be politically unpopular, what do you do? And I think that's where Republicans find themselves in certain states, at least, when it comes to the issue of abortion, because all of the polling shows that the American public doesn't like a regime that allows abortions at any time on demand. They do favor restrictions. On the other hand, the majority does not favor a total ban. So the question is, where do Republicans, who in particular believe with great sincerity, that uh, life begins at conception, then where do you come out with this? And, you know, Ron DeSantis now with a six-week bill is coming down pretty close to where the leaders of the anti-abortion movement are. I think part of his calculation, leaving apart his sincere beliefs, is the political calculation is that this will help him in the Republican primaries. Colin. Mike Pence, we know, is a firm believer in opposing abortion totally. Tim Scott has come out uh, this week and said the same thing. And uh, I think DeSantis's calculation is that he needs to peel off evangelical and Christian and other believers and abortion opponents to be able to win the primary. And that may be true. We'll see if it works. But it's also an open question whether or not this then becomes a liability in the November election if he wins the nomination. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think on the point of what's going to happen in the primary, you know that abortion voters, evangelical voters, are always some of the most motivated voters. Uh, That's been true in the GOP for decades, really. And I don't think it's going to be any less so. I think it's going to be probably even heightened this time around. But on the national point, you know, (laughs) Ron DeSantis may not think that he's going to have to run for governor of Florida again. That may be his plan. So he may not be particularly worried about exactly where all the voters of Florida line up. But there are a lot of other politicians who are going to be looking very closely at where the politics uh, sort out in their state. And it's not always as easy as you might think. You know, we've talked before, Paul, about what happened in Wisconsin, where you have a swing state, a very conservative state in many ways, but where a lot of uh, counties outside Milwaukee, where you have a lot of sort of soccer mom types and swing voters who voted uh, for this progressive judge, therefore swung the state Supreme Court to Janet Protosiewicz, who was very clear uh, about her support for abortion. So I think there's going to have to be that balance. I think the party does have to find a good message that isn't as restrictive as six weeks, which is an effective ban, but maybe not as loose as 15. You know, maybe it's somewhere in between. Maybe it's eight or nine or 10, somewhere there. Of course, the reply from the pro-life movement would be, well, Brian Kemp in Georgia ran for re-election in Georgia after the state legislature passed, and he signed a heartbeat bill at six weeks. So that was fine. You can survive there in Georgia, and how different is Florida? And if you're willing to stand up and make your case firmly and convincingly and make it an argument about conviction and defend it, Kim, then you can prevail even with the heartbeat bill. And we're going to find out. Look, I do not suggest that I know how this politics plays. My point about the pendulum is simply that it's notable that this is what Republicans in Florida are doing. Now, Florida is arguably not as much of a swing state as it was before. It has certainly moved a bit to the right. How durable is that? Is what matters that you simply enunciate a position, make your case? Do some voters in the end feel reassured that there are other states that are going to continue having very lax rules and so that if they really need to, they can get somewhere else and this can happen? Are other issues going to dominate this cycle, whether it be the economy or inflation or crime? Do people decide that they're not going to go out solely on the question of abortion? I mean, I think it's also going to play out differently in each state. One thing I think Republicans are going to have to look out for is that Democrats realized last year the benefit of, for instance, getting initiatives on the ballot that allow them to very much keep this issue top of minds as the voting public is going to the polls. I do think that that was something that benefited Brian Kemp and others and that that 
legislation was done, it was over, and he was able to talk about other things. Maybe that is what DeSantis is thinking here as well, too. There are a lot of different elements politically in this. My only point is that there's a lot of unknowns, too. And we've had a lot of indications up until now that this is something that is concerning voters and driving turnout for Democrats. And Republicans have best keep all that in mind as they go down this road. Yeah, the Republicans won a great and uh, long-fought victory when Dobbs' decision by the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. But it's also obvious that the Republicans were unprepared for the political aftermath. Uh, you know, under the Roe regime, they could simply say, I'm pro-life, and that's it, because Roe blocked any legal changes. So now Republicans have to actually defend their views on abortion and uh, perhaps have a more nuanced view, and then they have to defend that. And many are not uh, really prepared to do that. And I think they have to think about it and think through it more carefully and come to a position that they can defend both uh, morally, legally, and politically. All right, Kim, Colin, thanks so much for being here. This is an issue that's going to play out over many years, but particularly between now and November of 2024. Thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch. <music> 